Uh, so pin my screen so you know which scene we are on. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the new Commons for the launch event for Dimensions, Volume 33. My name is Christian Inverzat. I'm an associate professor of practice in architecture at Taubman College, and I'm the faculty advisor for Dimensions. Dimensions is a student-produced journal of architecture at Michigan, published annually since 1987. It's a remarkable achievement for any publication, let alone a student journal. I've been the advisor since volume 17. So this volume actually puts me over the halfway mark in this role. Uh, Dimensions 33 was designed and produced during the 2019-2020 uh, academic year which was, as we all know, interrupted in March with a move to remote online instruction. Despite the disruption, work on the journal continued and it was completed at the end of the term and went to press in May. Dimensions 33 includes select student work in the form of MARC thesis, undergraduate Wallenberg studio, masters of science work from 2019, along with uh, work from the ASRG, the architecture student research grant, work from 2020. It also includes work from the 2018-2019 Architecture Fellows and interviews with several visiting lecturers who spoke at the college uh, in 2019-2020. For tonight's event, we have the students who worked on Dimensions 33, some of whom are now students in the final year of their program, while others have graduated and now are now alumni of the college. Additionally, we have several contributors representing Wallenberg thesis and fellows. I'm excited that we have the opportunity tonight to spend some time discussing this achievement and the experience of working on the volume, as well as to discuss with the contributors what it means to have their work published in this format. I guess sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Okay, I think I think the gang's all here. Um, can people introduce themselves? You can do that, and I can start. Um, my name is Rachel Scott. I am a current senior in the BS program and worked on Dimensions 33, like the rest of my staff members here last year. Um, my name is Jenny Scarborough. I just graduated from the MARC program in May, um, and I worked on both Dimensions 32 and 33. Um, I'm Abirami Maniwanen. Um, I too graduated with Jenny in May. Um, and uh, yeah, I was also part of Dimension 33. My name is Leah. I'm a final year student in the architecture, Master of Architecture to Juji program. Yeah, I worked last year with the team on Dimensions 33 and yeah, looking forward to this. Um, I'm Maitre Mehta. I'm a second year student in AMARC at Taubman College and I was with Dimension 33 as well on this project. And uh, lastly, I'm Ben Vassar. Um, I'm a senior and undergrad um, taking Christian Studio with Rachel this semester. And I'm Anne Holm. i also graduated as the Master of Architecture this year, and I also work on Team 33. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the experience of working on the journal. So um, maybe this one's directed to Abi. How would you describe the overall experience of working on a project like Dimensions? And specifically, uh, were there any lessons that have prepared you for the work you are doing now? Um, so we joined Dimensions wanting to learn and be a part of processes behind publishing a book. But I think I can speak for everyone when I say that we learned so much more than that. 
Uh, yes, we went uh, into the details of curation, font types, um, paper, book binding, color, layout, and all the specificities. Uh, but we also developed discipline, uh, communication strategies, organizational skills, patience and peer support, which was very important, especially during our transition to working online. Um, uh, these skills, both technical and uh, the soft skills that I've acquired have been so helpful to me as a graduate, uh, as I have traversed to uh, very different scales of projects. Uh, in the past seven months, and I'm sure it'll gain uh, more relevance as I work towards the future. So in terms of the book itself, there are several different ways to view the book. What was the idea behind how it works and how was it developed? Um, so this year, the Dimensions team wanted to change the way readers uh, read the book. So the different projects in the book are organized not by their categories of studio like Thesis, Wallenberg, ASRG, and Fellows, but they're organized by their themes. So the main themes of the books uh, book is uh, digital realities, temporality, speculation, and ra land rights. And also each, each of these projects were given four tags that repeat across the book. And that's what you see on the cover of the book um, with these tags and uh, the categories of the project um, printed across. So it was a different way of actually uh, interpreting the book. And uh, interestingly, this was this was done, this decision was made um, before the pandemic hit. But also, I think right now, when I think about it, it, it creates that it's a reflection of that disruption uh, that the dimension Dimensions team wanted to highlight. And how that play out with respect to the, the design of the book's layout and the typography? Uh, yeah, so when we started looking um, for inspiration for Dimensions 33, we looked at past volumes and we noticed that while each of them were unique in their own style, um, the organization of the content was always very similar. So like Leah mentioned, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> um, we, um, we chose to break up the projects rather than being organized by their type um, of being like thesis, fellow lecture. We created the system of the tags um, that are found in the top right corner of the pages. And this system allows um, readers to find and explore the projects that are both similar, but also like within different categories. Um, and for the layout of the book, that having those tags in that top right corner was very important so that you could flip through and have a very quick understanding of the whole layout of the book. Um, and then to be able to stop and flag different projects that you found important. Or Is that Charlotte? Yes. Charlotte in the background? Yeah. I gave her a toy and she finished playing with it too soon, but she is here. <laughs> She was vital to the um, design of and creation of the book. <laughs> so, I think I think the tags were also super important just because it gives you a really quick sense of what people, um, what students were really interested in during that particular year, right? And how we were able to find a strong narrative um, and strong connections between all of these projects. I think it just kind of um, speaks to a bit of like the collectivity of our college as well. So let's let's talk about the use of the spot or specifically where it goes blue. Were there any particular challenges to its production? Um, thinking didn't some of this hands on work take place after the move to, to remote learning? So we use the colors in white and blue and blue are used mainly twice in the journal. One is as the interior side of the cover to kind of emphasize the depth of the paper. And as the color is pearly white, we want to kind of approach a sensitivity to see the reflection of blue on the white surface and also the subtle color that could pop up from the edge of the page. And the second location where we positioned the blue is in the middle of the journal, which works as the background of the table of contents. Another main reason to put the blue here is also to work as the object of this disruption. 
as the page cut the letter from the editor from the middle and kind of indicate uh, the current global situation. So one challenge we had is to pick the right glue. So we look at different samples and also the potential texture. And lucky enough that we had the decision made actually before we moved to the remote environment. Yeah. So how were the interviews conducted and what were the challenges in presenting those conversations within the journal? Um, so Rachel and I interviewed uh, Mark Berry, who's the head architect at the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Um, and obviously we had some questions prepared, but um, talking to him for an hour, the conversation kind of dovetailed into um, other areas of interest, um, which included him making some um, value judgments about like national borders and universal basic income. Um, and so I was really careful to edit that text down um, and then corresponding with him afterwards. Um, there are 23 email correspondences between us, um, just making sure that he's not being represented in a way that he doesn't want to be. So, um, in terms of the transition from uh, working in person to working remotely, um, were there any other lessons? Because there's a dedicated publications room where both Dimensions and the Urban Planning Jour Journal Agora are able to come together and work. It's kind of a dedicated, dedicated space to um, kind of get your heads together and, and be together. Um, were there, were there any lessons that you carried over as, as we went to remote uh, instruction and holding meetings like this? Yeah, so I, I think that in-person and remote had their own pros and cons, um, but the design process that we were kind of doing was an exchange of ideas primarily through pinups, like you mentioned in the publication room. So we would like draw over each other's templates, discuss iterations of typography. And I think most importantly, we were studying books. So we would pick up books from libraries and really like understand texture and the paper quality. Um, so transition to remote was, I would say it was not easy, but as a team, we were really determined to kind of deliver the book that we were so deeply invested in. So we made a trip as a team to ULITO, made edits on the draft copy multiple times, either on paper or digital. And we also made sure to meet regularly during the week um, via Zoom to keep a check on each other. So I think I'd say that a few lessons we really learned was um, to always be prompt, to never postpone tasks, um, clear and honest communication, and most importantly, a determination to finish what we were committed to. Yeah, I, I'll just add that um, there was a lot of momentum that the team had going going into March. So as disruptive as it was, uh, for me, Dimensions was the most consistent thing that I had going on last, last spring. So it was, uh, I think it was, it was that momentum that carried it through. Okay. Um, Thanks everyone. Just a reminder that the staff should now turn off their cameras. We're gonna jump into a couple other sessions now. Thank you, Christian. And um, as we go through these sections, I will be introducing um, some of the contributors whose work shows up in Dimensions. Um, the first contributor that we'll be talking to is Grace. Um, she was a senior last year um, in the Wallenberg studio. Her project is called Learnscapes. Um, and Grace, if you'd like to turn on your camera. Hello. Um, wait, Everett's here too, except our, our camera looks. Maybe it doesn't work. Um. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Everett. <laughs> okay. Hey, Grace. Hey, Everett. Hey. So, um, 
a couple of things. Like, uh, could you tell us uh, what each of you are doing now and then provide a quick synopsis of your project? Okay, um, I'm currently working at SOM in San Francisco as a graphic designer. Um, I've been here like a year now. Uh, it's been kind of fun. Um, I'm working for Smith Group in Detroit, although I'm working remotely for the time being. In San Francisco? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and then wh what about a quick synopsis of your project? Yeah, so, um, so we were in Brittany Utting's uh, Wallenberg studio last year which had a focus on pedagogy. Um, and that is the basis of our project where we looked at the future of, a, a speculative future of pedagogy that was based around um, technology and how that reinforces learning through images and such. So maybe here's a specific question, like what does it mean for you to have your work published in Dimensions? Um, Dimension, well, I worked on 32. Um, and before that, I always really loved like the publication, especially, I think it was uh, 30. Um, like it's always on people's desks and studios and like you're always flipping through it to look for um, precedent and just to have your work kind of um, I don't know, memorialized or like laid out in a publication along with um, some of the best work from the rest of the school. Um, it just, um, it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really cool. Uh, I mean, like obviously uh, all Tottenham students know about dimensions mm -hmm. and I get the book every year and look through it. Um, it's not something going in through um, my, my education that I really thought about, but when I had the opportunity to submit my work uh, for Dimensions, we definitely jumped at it and we were lucky enough to be accepted. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool. Yeah, and then like people flip through the book and know our works there. And just to be clear, Grace, despite you having been a former editor, it's a it's a peer it's a blind peer review. So, <laughs> so you didn't you didn't have a leg up. Yeah, yeah. It's um, we were we were just lucky enough to be to have our work selected to be included in this uh, publication. So let's let's talk about that. I'm curious to know because there's a bit of a lag. So you 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 both graduated in 2019. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. This the spring of 2019, and then you submitted in the in that fall, and then it was worked on o over the year. So I'm I'm curious, like, did the did the publication process like alter your own reading of the work, right? Like in preparing it, revising it, or now that you've had some distance and you're seeing it seeing it again in this yeah. format? Um, I would say. Yeah, a couple of things is first of all, when you leave your work and then come back to it, it's always it always feels a bit like kind of weird. You question some of the decisions you made um, and some of the things you you wrote or whatever. And then also like when it comes to reformatting for any type, any new medium, whether it's a portfolio or like a submission for dimensions, you're have to like you're some, you're scrapping things you're leaving it out and that really affects how you tell the story behind the work um, and given that our project was hugely uh, narrative driven um, it really focused us to do a lot of rewriting and figure out how to best tell um, the story even though we had to leave out certain images and drawings so do you have any particular reflections or advice for fellow uh, undergraduate students that are going into their final semester? I feel like it's really different now. Um, their experience is so different from what we did as like the 
um, because starting last year, everything became Zoom University. Um, But uh, when we were looking through the book, we were um, like mentioning how our work sits on a page because when we were, um, when we were working on our final drawings and final production materials, we were working on them for like a, a wall. So all our drawings were at like three or like four feet wide and um, how they sit on a page now, like you mentioned earlier, this isn't that yeah. relevant. Something I've been <laughs> reflecting on pretty recently is um, when it came to uh, like the research that went behind uh, the project, I wish we had taken more time to effectively um, present that as much as the synthesis of the work. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, yeah, I would, if I were to give like one piece of advice, it's to maybe take as much time or um, be as thoughtful with presenting the research and background um, with presenting the design and synthesis. Time goes quick, so mm-hmm. sounds like be sure you don't let it get by you, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. All right. Um, anything else you'd like to share? <laughs> no. I mean, thank you for mm-hmm. having us. This is really cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you guys did a great job. Uh, I got my book just, I had to have it forwarded from Detroit, so mm-hmm. I just got it uh, pretty recently, actually. Uh, and yeah, it looks great. Great. Sounds good. Grace, we'll get you your copy soon. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Grace and Everett. Uh, I miss you guys both greatly. Um, our next Um, contributor that we'll be talking to is Jordan Lorela. Um, He graduated um, from his MARC thesis last year um, and his project is called Protocol Please. Hello, hello. Hi, Jordan. How are you, Christian? I'm doing well. Nice to see you. Yeah. So you probably are getting a sense of the of the drill here. Yeah, be I helpful, am. Helpful, I, I I think, for you to to tell us what you're doing now, um, and then just give us a quick synopsis of your thesis work. Yeah, of course. Um, so I, for about a year now, I've been working at KPF uh, in New York. Although in pandemic times, I've moved back to Atlanta, which has been fortunate. Like. Got some work to do in Georgia, us Democrats. So that was nice. Nice to be back in the state for that. Um, But yeah, working for KPF. On my first day, I strolled into the New York office, ready to start like a New York life. And I sit down at my desk and they're like, oh, Jordan, by the way, you're on the University of Michigan project. And they brought me right back to Michigan and working on a project for the university now, so. That's, that's fun, it's fun. Um, and my project, yeah, protocol please. Uh, I was interested in rulemaking and instructions as a architectural invention, something that um, could produce difference within some acceptable degree of similarity, but that wasn't focused on making a building. So instead I made a paper form that people filled out. And so through check boxes and filling out their signature and specifying numbers and through different parameters here and there, we're able to design a building. Um, And I think that came like, having spent time away from the project, I think that I realized the kind of behind the scenes aspiration of the project was, kind of an impulse to decouple architecture from architects. I was growing up in the suburbs. Like I like, I like, I like the suburbs. I like sprawl cities. I think they're interesting. And so this project was um, 
a fun way to explore different ways to access design without the designer um, too involved. And so that was like, that was designing a process that was designing these paper forms rather than fixating on whatever end product. Yeah, that's, I don't know, that's how I see it now. Um, and and uh, in, ter in terms of seeing it, it again, like, um, I mean, you've, uh, like, like Grace, you also worked, worked on former volumes of dimensions, maybe, maybe are one of only a handful of people that, that worked on it um, for, for two years uh, <laughs> together. So what's, what's it, what's it like for you to have like a stepped away from that role and then participated on, on the out, on the outside, so to speak? Um, I think it made the process of um, looking at my project again, months after thesis had ended so much simpler that months later I was able to reopen all the project files. And I don't know, also because I had time apart that helps of course too, but having been on the staff for two years and working with uh, projects in this kind of format, it was super helpful for me when I was submitting to be like, oh, this is, this is the most productive way to format the project. This is the simplest, this is the easiest. And it streamlined uh, the submission process for me. And I think that's actually a skill that's come very much in handy like at work. Um, because I do a lot of the presentations for work and that's it's definitely a valuable skill that's translated well to professional life. So, yeah. I think, you know, dimension, I think part of dimensions is that it, it prides itself in being able to present a project in its, in, its entirety. It's not, yeah. it's not a catalog of, of, of um, an entire year's output at an institution. It's not, uh, re necessarily representative of every studio at every every level, but it's but still architecture students can produce a whole lot of stuff in in a year. <laughs> so I'm curious in terms of just um, like distilling the work and and pairing kind of paring it down, determining what's what's essential and what's wh like how it finds its way into that format. Um, you know, as as a as a former mm -hmm. ed editor, do you think that allowed you to to anticipate that, or did um, you know did the kind of interaction with with the with the the editors um, like have a have a say in that? No, I think for this, like I lean, I was fortunate to lean on past experience because I know. I know from working with contributors when I was on the staff that a lot of people can get very precious about their material and they do want to like overload you with um, everything they have to share. And it can be a lot in many instances, but um, from my end, like I, I, I think I did a pretty good job of like narrowing down and submitting a submitting just enough material to fill it out. At least I, I, that's what I tell myself. I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but like, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what I sent and I'm proud of what came out in the book when I got it in the mail. It was fantastic. And do you, do you have any particular um, advice for um, kind of current thesis students who are wrapping up thesis prep, um, how they might um, think about going into this uh, last year? Um, I think my only piece of advice is it's pretty trite, pretty stereotypical, but just that I wish someone had told me this, someone had like beaten this into my head before I started thesis, but um, good work doesn't depend on you killing yourself. Just that you 
can set boundaries. You can have a healthy lifestyle. You can have everything you want in life and still make good work. And I was someone who's like, I felt the pressure and the expectations and it was thesis. It was thesis with a capital T, but um, that's not totally necessary. And that's just makes for what could be and what should be a very productive experience, very stressful. So maybe I'll be the first one to tell prospective thesis students, it, it's not that big of a deal. You get a full night's sleep. Just, just get a full night's sleep. That's it. Have breakfast. You'll still make good there, work. There's a good chance you, you and other students have been told this before and just didn't, <laughs> weren't able to hear what, true, was, what you true, were being true, told, true. so. Yes, very much, yeah. Okay, um, anything else you would care to share? Um, I, no, I feel, I feel satisfied. Anything else you care to ask, but you know, I loved getting the book in the mail. It was a fantastic book. It was striking and um, it was great to um, see the projects organized in such like a radically different way that was refreshing. And so I applaud the staff for doing truly a great job with this. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Jordan. It was good seeing you. Take care. Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, our next contributor is not a student. Um, he is actually a lecturer at Taubman College right now. Um, but in the 2018-2019 year, he was the Walter B. Sanders Fellow at the University of Michigan. Um, dimensions, along with student publications, we also publish um, the, that year's fellows. So Peter, I believe he's also teaching a UG1 studio this semester. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. Peter, um, good to see you. Good to see you as well, Christian. Thanks for having me uh, and to the whole Dimensions team for, for inviting me. Yeah, no, certainly. I think, um, you know, the, the fellowship program at the college uh, plays a really important role in the, in the pedagogy of the school and it's kind of lo like livelihood. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the fellows have been a kind of staple um, you know, since uh, I think the, the early to mid mid nineties. So I think it's, it's uh, you know, there's things that change every year and there's things that um, are, are worth continuing to do and, and showcasing the work of the fellows and, and using dimensions as a, as a form from that, uh, you know, is something we've been happy to uphold. Um, I think Rachel touched on it a little bit. Is it possible you could just tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing now, um, um, this might be kind of a little more intertwined, like what you're doing now um, while also telling us about the thesis work you did, but maybe if there's ways to sort of spin some of this together, how, how those things are related, the, the role that the fellowship played into your sort of continued work and practice. Yeah. I, I I think for me, perhaps the, the relationship is more direct than some others. Um, so I'm actually still working with the organization that I um, researched and partnered with for the fellowship. Uh, so part of that fellowship was very much intended to not just create a project within the span of a year and have it end at the, um, at the exhibition, but to actually create the foundations for a longer term project. Uh, so to, to explain it a little bit more through the lens of the project, um, in one sentence, I would say that it was to help and tell the story, uh, help tell the story and imagine the future of a building uh, that has gone undergone several transitions in its uh, hundred or a year or so history, uh, kind of standing in Po Town in Detroit. Um, and digging a little bit deeper, the project was about identifying a, a process uh, that was simultaneously intensely related to architecture, but also fell out of the purview of what we would typically consider uh, an architect's work. 
So I began the fellowship year in 2018 by first researching uh, several self-initiated renovation and rebuilding projects in Detroit uh, that didn't fall under the kind of typical time frame and financing structure of building projects. Uh, and these included the Heidelberg Project, uh, the Davos African Bee Museum. Um, and we were really interested in how working on such projects could both broaden the, the array of work that architects can take on but also disrupt the rigid way that projects are conceived and completed. So projects that, that I was familiar with um, before coming back to Taubman in practice. So ultimately, after doing the research, we actually went to Detroit a couple of times, um, visited these sites and began deeper conversations with an organization called 555, uh, which is a nonprofit that actually initially started in Ann Arbor and eventually over their two decade period of history moved from a warehouse in Ann Arbor that was eventually demolished to become the new uh, YMCA um, uh, downtown. And then they moved to Ypsilanti into a former grocery store. And then they were in Detroit in a warehouse uh, at a time they were at a former uh, precinct police station. And then finally they, they uh, uh, acquire this building uh, in Poe Town, which is a former tobacco manufacturing and storage building. Uh, and they're trying to reimagine it into a community arts hub. So um, the project was very much focused around that collaboration and it's a collaboration that that's still ongoing. I was actually, um, what, what we're doing right now is actually putting together a book that is, envisioning a kind of future. So essentially a design proposal for what their future building might uh, look like. And so if, you know, if, if Dimensions was, re was, was reflective and sort of capturing the, the, the fellowship work you did um, for 555, it sounds like you've, you've kind of pivoted and there's kind of a, a newly projective version. Um, did the, the, the kind of process of, of, I mean, it's interesting. I, I like on the one hand, there's like this work you're doing in Detroit, but then, uh, you know, looking at some of the photos, seeing it in the exhibition space. And then it's like doc here, like for example here, and then taking um, the documentation of the exhibition and, and having it, it kind of find a life um, with, with the publication. Um, uh, did, did any of that uh, kind of like process of kind of dist distilling or, or assembling this work for publication allow you to see it in a, in a new light? Yeah, it, I think it's always interesting to revisit um, a project and the, the time frame of dimensions is really interesting to me because it gives you basically a year to distance yourself and um, and with time, you know, and with new experiences, you always go back and begin to understand a project in a different way. Uh, and I always use this rereading as a way to kind of draw inspiration from my uh, previous work for my current work. Um, when I started writing the piece for Dimensions, one thing that kind of struck out to me, which I had already started thinking about was, there was just a lot of material that was generated for the project. Uh, first, there were all the historic documents that we found uh, around Detroit's early 20th century tobacco industry, uh, images of Po Town, which we researched. We had this kind of amazing, highly detailed Sanborn map that showed the original use of the, the tobacco building uh, broken down by level. And that's before we even get to the material related to the building itself. Uh, our installation process, and then um, what 555 does as an organization. Uh, so being able to kind of create this piece for Dimensions was to think about, um, what allowed me to think about how to curate uh, one narrative of the, the story that perhaps is kind of best told to the audience that reads Dimensions. So the architectural community, but also the students, the faculty uh, uh, at Michigan. Um, and 
ultimately, uh, what I thought was really interesting about how the piece turned out was that it made us it made a claim for that the project was didn't really exist in kind of one uh, instantiation or or one proposal, at, at that but that the project really existed um, kind of in between all this diverse material, but at the same time was still held together by a central idea, a, a kind of collective theme. Uh, so the writing the piece and kind of even going back and looking through all the material was, was really helpful in formulating that. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. Maybe, maybe along those lines, um, you know, given the, the career arc you've taken and had the opportunity to um, do this work, reflect on it, and then still, still be working on it in, in new ways. Um, is there any, any advice uh, uh, you, you might offer students of architecture that are, that are looking for ways to um, kind of advance or take a non-traditional route with respect to their education and their career? Yeah, there's, uh, I can think of a lot of advice, uh, but maybe to kind of distill it here and to relate it to dimensions. Um, and this took a lot of just trying out and collaborating and, and working, but over the years, I've become increasingly interested in uh, not thinking of architecture as residing within the single building proposal. It's it's not like, I think there's really an emphasis on the, the building itself or the proposal itself representing all of um, your identity and your contribution as an architect. Uh, but over time, I really have been interested in all these other mediums and uh, other ways that architects communicate, um, you know, through the written essay, um, a really foundational experience I had was working on a book myself uh, that was recently published. And with that process, it was uh, a very intensive collaboration process with the graphic designer. And it was just really interesting to begin to understand their world and see how they treated the book in the same way that we treat in a piece of architecture. So thinking about its structure, its layout, its style, the way that it's either in conversation or kind of in dialogue with other books that preceded it. Um, and I found that by thinking about how architecture exists as, a, as an idea or as a, as a kind of mode of being or operating um, across all these different mediums also allowed me to open my project to a broader audience and to bring other people in, into this collaboration and, and to really think together through the project. Uh, so I think that translates to, you know, the advice being to, to keep an open mind about what architecture is and where it can be found uh, and to think about it in relation uh, to other larger processes of design and communication, but also society and the way that it very much you know, creates the, the kind of milieu or the environment that architecture operates within, but we always have a, a desire to affect uh, and just continue being open-minded and, and explore what your project is about and what it can mean. That's great. I'll keep an eye on 555 and the stuff you're doing with them. Best of luck, keeping it moving. Thanks. Maybe it'll, it'll uh, another version of the project will appear in Dimensions in the future. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I have a few announcements to make. Um, thanks for tuning in tonight. I want to thank everyone for for joining us. I hope it was I hope it was. Uh, Hope it wasn't too painful. Um, I'd especially like to thank Ishan for his work behind the scenes to make this presentation possible. Um, the Dimension staff, it was great seeing everyone together. I joked it looked a little bit like the Brady Bunch with the, with the blue backgrounds earlier. Um, and of course the, part, uh, the contributors for 
participating as, as well. Um, a couple things in terms of how to get copies, your, your copies of Dimensions 33. So we mailed copies to all 2020 graduates of the architecture program, um, as well as to all contributors towards the end of summer, um, maybe a little bit into fall. If you haven't received a copy, um, just reach out to me or uh, Dimensions and, and we'll, look, we'll look into it. We all know there's been some issues with the post office uh, this fall. Um, current students in the architecture program are entitled to a, a complimentary copy. We set copies out in the commons at, at school last week. And some people were able to get them um, last week and this week. Um, that's probably no longer possible for the remainder of this term. So we'll make arrangements next term to get copies to students one way or another. I guess if 2020 has taught us anything, it's to be flexible. Um, all volumes of dimensions uh, from dimensions one all the way through dimensions 33 are posted to issue and are available for download. So you can check them out. Obviously there's nothing like uh, the, the actual artifact. There's a lot of care that goes into their, their design and, and production. I think if anyone's really desperate to get a copy um, and wanted to pay for shipping or they were willing to pay for the shipping and the handling, we could probably find a way to get you a copy. Um, so again, you could, you could reach out. But um, maybe the big announcement, the thing we're really excited about um, on behalf of the Dimension staff is that uh, a new website has launched today. Uh, so I'll, I'll let Rachel talk a little bit about that. Sure. Thanks, Christian. Um, the new website is www, well, obviously, dimensionsjournal.us, as in the United States. Um, and um, you can find all the past issues, um, past volumes on the website. There is also a store where you can buy the last four copies, I believe, the last four, the last five volumes. And I believe, Christian, correct me if I'm wrong, if you buy all five, we'll give you Dimensions 33 for free. I'd say if you buy, if you buy, uh, if you buy any three, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll give you a fourth for free. Whoa, that's a pretty good deal. Um, and if you, if you buy a different one uh, and you're paying for shipping to get that one and you're a current student, we can use that as a way to send you, you your copy of Dimensions 33. That's cool. Um, other things on the website, um, I guess there's a link to our Instagram as well, um, which is just Dimensions Journal. Um, look out in the future, maybe the store might have some particular merchandise that people could purchase. Um, follow our Instagram, you never know, but yeah. Thank you. And then, and then just to say that uh, the staff of Dimensions 34 were the ones who put the website together. Um, so it was part of the kickoff. Next, the next year's group is already hard at work, um, working on the next volume slated for publication in the spring with advanced copies to 2021 graduates. Um, but uh, I guess I'd just like to close by saying, hopefully we can continue this type of event um, and establish a new, a new tradition. It was lot, I think it was lots of fun. It was great to um, bring former staff back in a way that we, we often can't do. So have a good and safe and healthy holiday season and um, have a good night. Thank you. And thank you, Christian, for hosting. <laughs>